For most people, when we think of D-Day, we think of the troops hitting the beaches in Normandy, or the paratroopers that dropped from the sky a few hours before. But there was a third dimension to D-Day that is mostly overlooked or ignored today, but it was the very thing that put the men onto the beaches, the naval operation. The naval component of D-Day was codenamed Operation Neptune and was under British control, commanded by Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsay, the man who had been responsible for the Dunkirk evacuation in 1940. It was perhaps appropriate that Ramsay should have been responsible for bringing the troops back to France four long years later. Incidentally, I was pleased to note that Ramsay was educated in my hometown of Colchester in Essex. Can you imagine the size of the force of ships required to land over 150,000 British, Canadian, American and French troops on five different beaches? It was almost 7,000, from huge battleships to tiny landing craft. Call of War World War II is a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide. You fight up to 100 other players in real time in games that can take weeks to complete. The games feature World War II historically accurate maps and units that allows you to create your own path and rewrite history. Call of War World War II is fully cross-platformed. Your objective is to take over the world, define your own strategy, build powerful armies by combining dozens of different unit types, and fight for world domination. Mark Felton Productions viewers are getting a special gift. Click on the link below to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available for only 30 days, so click the link in the description, choose a country and fight your way to victory in epic real-time battles. It was the largest amphibious invasion in history and took years to meticulously plan. What we are going to do today is look at some of the surviving D-Day ships and how they slotted into the Operation Neptune plan. It is not realised that the majority of sailors on D-Day were British, as indeed were the majority of the fleet involved, which included ships from eight different navies. Britain supplied 892 warships out of the 1,213 involved and 3,261 landing craft out of a total of 4,126 such vessels. Many of the Americans that hit the beaches on D-Day were, contrary to what you see in films such as Saving Private Ryan, carried ashore in British manned landing craft. 112,824 Royal Navy personnel served on D-Day, plus 25,000 British members of the Merchant Navy with the United States Navy providing the second biggest contingent, 52,889. The invasion armada was divided into two task forces, Western Task Force under U.S. Admiral Alan G. Kirk, covering Utah, Pont du Oc, and Omaha landing areas, and Eastern Task Force under Royal Navy Admiral Sir Philip Vian, covering Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches. Each task force was subdivided into multiple smaller groups with specific tasks, from shore bombardment to clearing lanes through minefields to actually landing troops under fire. For the sailors involved, D-Day actually began much earlier, several days earlier in fact, when many of the ships began to move across to Normandy. You must remember the invasion was supposed to happen on the 5th of June 1944, but was delayed for 24 hours because of bad weather, so most of the ships were already in position for several days prior to that. Some of the first into action were the minesweepers that began clearing channels for the invasion fleet, and they completed their tasks without incident shortly before dawn on the 6th of June. Several ships still survive that took part in this first activity. The first vessel of Omaha Beach was the British Harbour Defence Motor Launch HMS Medusa. She arrived off the beach 12 hours before the US landings began to act as a marker to show the entrance to a narrow channel to be swept by minesweepers through the German minefield protecting the beach. She and an identical vessel had motored 90 miles from Portland in England, originally on the 4th of June. Once on station, she marked the entrance to the channel for the minesweepers to begin clearing paths towards Omaha Beach. At Gold Beach, another small Royal Navy vessel was doing the same job as Medusa. 
Harbour Defence Motor Launch ML1392 was navigation leader, marking the boundary to the minefield channel of the beach. Built in 1943, she is a motor launch that belonged to the 149th Motor Launch Flotilla on D-Day. ML1392 served post-war in the customs and excise, and then passed into private hands and was completely rebuilt as a luxury cruiser, losing her wartime looks. Currently this vessel is being restored to how she looked on D-Day. HMS Medusa still looks exactly the same as she did during World War II, having been extensively restored and carefully looked after, and she can be found today at Haslar Marina in Gosport in Hampshire. Moving forward to sweep the channels clear of mines was a small armada of British and American minesweepers, and today only one D-Day veteran minesweeper still exists, USS Threat. And incredibly, she is still serving in her original role, though no longer with the United States Navy. Threat is an Orc-class minesweeper that entered service in 1942, 93 of this class being built, with a crew of around 105 officers and men. She departed Tor Bay in Devon, England on the 5th of June, helping to clear the channels to be used by fire support ships in the Bay de la Seine off the Overlord beaches. In the following days, her crew witnessed the destruction by German mines of three US warships, and narrowly missed herself being destroyed on the 8th of June in an incident that claimed a US destroyer. In 1973, USS Threat was sold to Mexico, where she currently serves as the ARM Francisco Zarco. The next phase of the landings was shore bombardment, as the big battle wagons and cruisers pummeled known German defences preparatory to the actual landings, and continued to strike as and when needed during and after the landings, providing invaluable gunfire support for the troops ashore. A number of D-Day bombardment ships survive today. The destroyer USS Laffey sailed for Normandy on the 3rd of June 1944 from Plymouth in England, escorting tugs and landing craft across the English Channel. On the 6th of June, Laffey provided a screen to seaward to support operations at Utah Beach, bombarding shore targets on the 8th to 9th of June 1944. Her 336 crew would be in constant action of Normandy and Brittany, dealing with the e-boat threat, or coming under fire from German shore batteries, and she was damaged on one occasion. Decommissioned in 1975, USS Laffey is now preserved as a museum ship in South Carolina and as a US National Historic Landmark. The Bombarding Forces flagship of Omaha Beach still survives the battleship USS Texas. An old ship in 1944, Texas dated from around 1912, a dreadnought battleship of the old school. In World War II, she had been pressed into convoy escort duties in the Atlantic and shore bombardment during the Operation Torch landings in North Africa in 1942. She had been modified over the years and her systems upgraded, and her 10 14-inch guns gave her a formidable hitting power, able to pulverise targets over 20 miles away. On D-Day, Texas was assigned to provide fire support to the western half of Omaha Beach, where the US 29th Infantry Division was landing, and Pont du Oc in support of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Texas was supported in this role by the British light cruiser HMS Glasgow and some US and Royal Navy destroyers. She began off Pont du Oc at 0441 hours, commencing fire at 0550 against six German guns, firing 255 14-inch shells in 34 minutes. Her 5-inch guns were simultaneously firing at exit D1 on Omaha Beach. At 0626, Texas shifted her fire to the western side of Omaha Beach at Viaville. During the disastrous landings that followed, Texas closed to only 3,000 yards off Omaha Beach to attack German positions just beyond exit D1 in front of Viaville. The 7th of June, she escorted two landing craft packed with ammunition and other supplies to help the rangers who were isolated at Pont Duoc. 
Decommissioned in 1946, she became a museum ship in Texas and has been subject to several lengthy restorations and repair programs, including the most recent, a $95 million restoration program. She left dry dock on the 5th of March 2024, repairs now ongoing afloat. Off Gold and Juno beaches on D-Day was Bombardment Group E, and the flagship for Rear Admiral Frederick Dalrymple Hamilton was the Royal Navy light cruiser HMS Belfast. She had departed the River Clyde on the 2nd of June to sail to Normandy. Commissioned in 1936, Belfast is a town-class light cruiser of 11,550 tons, one of ten such vessels constructed. She had famously assisted in the destruction of the German warship Scharnhorst in 1943. Her main armament consists of 12 six-inch guns. At 0530 on the 6th of June 1944, HMS Belfast opened fire on a German artillery battery at Ver sur Mer, suppressing its fire until men of the 7th Battalion the Green Howards, coming off Gold Beach, overran it. On the 12th of June, she provided naval gunfire support for Canadian forces at Juneau Beach. During five weeks of action off Normandy, Belfast fired 1,996 six-inch shells. She was due to be scrapped in 1967, but the decision was taken to preserve her as a museum ship for the nation, and since 1971 she has been moored permanently on the River Thames in London and since 1978 belongs to the Imperial War Museum. One German vessel that served on D-Day also still exists. The only German naval opposition to D-Day came from E-boats, or as the Germans call S-boats, the S standing for Schnell, for quick or fast. Fast motor torpedo boats operating out of Cherbourg. S-130, commissioned in 1943, is the very last S-boat to exist in the entire world, and took part in the infamous Exercise Tiger attack, when E-boats disrupted a D-Day training exercise off Slapton Sands in Devon in April 1944, resulting in huge loss of life among American soldiers. On D-Day itself, S-130 was one of several vessels of the 9th S-boat flotilla that sortied from Cherbourg but when confronted by the vast and well-protected Allied Armada, fired their torpedoes at maximum range before heading back to Cherbourg. After the war, S-130 was used by British intelligence during the early stages of the Cold War, before being given to the new German Navy, the Bundesmarine, in 1957. She later became a houseboat and was purchased by Kevin Wheatcroft for restoration to World War II configuration, which is still ongoing today. It is planned that S-130 will eventually be displayed as a museum vessel at Biddeford in Devon. Following the naval bombardments, the landing of the troops commenced. The first landings occurred at Utah Beach at 0630, followed by Omaha Beach through to Gold, Juno and Sword, the last commencing by 0730. Thousands of small landing craft took part. For example, an LCVP, or Higgins boat, from Omaha Beach is preserved at the American Heritage Museum. The LCVP, or Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, could carry a platoon of 36 men to the beach, and during World War II, 23,358 were built. Just 36 feet long, they had a maximum speed of 12 knots, and were crewed by four naval personnel. The men boarded via a cargo net slung over the side of a troop ship out at sea and exited via the boat's lowered bow ramp. Although several survive, actual D-Day used examples are extremely rare. One is currently being restored at Battery Maisie, a Grand Comte Normandy, which was found in a local farm in 2008. The British personnel landing craft was the LCA, or Landing Craft Assault, that carried a platoon of 31 men at around 7 knots, the soldiers exiting also via a bow ramp. It also had a crew of four from the Royal Navy. One and a half thousand LCAs survived the war to be sold off, many being converted into houseboats. One little mystery is this LCA that used to be at the D-Day Museum at Aramanche in Normandy. 
This LCA was used by Allied forces on D-Day, but the museum reportedly scrapped it due to its bad condition some years ago, though some sources also suggest that it was bought by a private collector. Perhaps this little mystery will one day be solved. In order to clear beach defences and support the troops fighting inland, tanks were needed urgently on the beaches. An attempt was made to land DD tanks or duplex drive or swimming tanks, but many of these were destroyed or sunk during the first wave. However, following on came a larger type of landing craft, the landing craft tank. A single British LCT from D-Day survives today. LCT 7074 is one of 235 Mark III landing craft tanks built in the UK. 192 feet long, with a crew of 12, the Mark III could carry 11 Sherman tanks or 5 Churchill infantry tanks, exiting via bow doors and a ramp. On the 6th of June 1944, LCT 7074 was part of the 18th LCT flotilla and landed one Cromwell, two Shermans and seven Stuart tanks of the 22nd Armoured Brigade on Gold Beach. Thereafter, she ferried troops, vehicles and supplies across the English Channel to support the fighting in Normandy. Decommissioned in 1947, 7074 was later used as a clubhouse, a nightclub, and then a preserved warship in the collection of the Warship Preservation Trust. Unfortunately, that organisation went into receivership in 2006, and 7074 ended up partially sunk in Birkenhead and under threat of being scrapped. However, a £916,000 grant saw her salvage for the nation in 2014 with restoration complete in 2020. She is now on permanent display at the D-Day Story Museum in Portsmouth, Hampshire, the only D-Day LCT still in existence, though other LCTs have survived that are not connected to Operation Neptune. Once combat operations to clear the beaches had been successful, and though the beaches were often still under artillery fire, larger ships could be brought directly into shore and beached, disgorging tanks and other vehicles, and of course thousands of tons of supplies that were desperately needed. These are landing ship tanks. At least four LSTs that served in the Normandy landing survived today, including LST-279, which was commissioned into the US Navy in 1943 and took part in training manoeuvres along the south coast of England in 1944 in preparation for D-Day. Placed under British operational control for the landings, she carried troops and vehicles to Normandy, unloading at Juneau Beach on the morning of the 7th of June 1944, returning to England with casualties. On her second trip to Normandy, LST-279 narrowly escaped being sunk by German e-boats, a torpedo passing only 20 feet in front of her bows. By June 1945, LST-279 had made 74 channel crossings in support of operations ashore. After post-war service in the Korean War, in 1955 she was transferred to the Republic of China Navy in Taiwan. She remains an active warship today, one of several World War II-era LSTs still in use by Taiwan. Two LSTs are preserved in the United States. Both of the surviving LSTs fought at Omaha Beach. An LST or a landing ship tank was a specially designed US vessel, a thousand being built in World War II. Previous to this, the British had modified existing ships into LSTs with the primary addition of bow doors, seeing extensive use during the invasions of North Africa and Sicily. Purpose-built LSTs also saw action during these operations. Displacing 3,880 tons, fully loaded, and with a crew of 10 officers, about 100 to 115 men, they could carry tanks and vehicles right to the beach. The LSTs actually beaching themselves and then being refloated at high tide. LST-325, commissioned in 1943, carried 59 vehicles, 30 officers and 396 enlisted personnel on her first trip to Omaha Beach on the 6th of June 1944. She carried 38 wounded back to England on that first day and would go on to make 40 trips across the English Channel in 1944-45. 
After leaving U.S. service in 1964, LST-325 was sold to the Greek Navy until, in 1999, she was acquired by a restoration group and sailed back to the U.S. in 2001. She is currently a museum ship at Evansville, Indiana, and she is still afloat 80 years after D-Day. The other Omaha Beach veteran tank landing ship preserved as a museum is LST-393. Commissioned in 1942, 393 took part in the landings at Sicily and Salerno in 1943. 393 arrived off Omaha Beach in the evening of the 6th of June 1944, offloading Sherman tanks, and was then stranded for two days. She made 30 round trips to the beach from England, carrying vehicles and supplies and bringing off wounded and German prisoners of war. Sold into private hands in 1948, 393 has been under restoration since 2000, and today is a museum ship at Muskegon in Michigan. Incredibly, one LST from Normandy is still working, LST-510. Commissioned in January 1944, on the 1st of June of that year, she embarked 70 vehicles and 200 troops, the U.S. 29th Infantry Division joining the Western Task Force of Normandy. Eight hours after the first landing on Omaha Beach, LST-510 unloaded her cargo via LCTs and Rhino pontoon barges. Over the following three months, she shuttled between England and Utah and Omaha beaches repeatedly. Sold in 1960 to the Chesapeake Bay Ferry District of Norfolk, Virginia, she was resold in 1964 to the Delaware River and Bay Authority, being renamed MV Cape Henlopen. She currently operates as a ferry between New London in Connecticut and Orient, Long Island, New York. Another type of support craft that saw extensive service during and after D-Day were naval tugs doing the boring donkey work of towing ammunition barges across the English Channel. In fact, this was vital work. Two U.S. Army tugs that did this invaluable work still survive today. LT-5 was a large tug, delivered in 1943 to the Corps of Engineers. LT-5 was sent to Normandy on the 6th of June 1944, towing two ammunition barges. On the 9th of June, she actually shot down a German fighter plane and remained working off the beaches for a month. Renamed the John F. Nash in 1946, she worked until 1989 on the lower Great Lakes region. Restored to her wartime configuration, she is a museum ship at the H. Lee White Marine Museum in Oswego, New York. One of her sister vessels from D-Day, LT-4 Major Wilbur Browder, now called the Tug Luddington, also towed barges on D-Day and also worked the Great Lakes post-war. This vessel is preserved as a museum at Harbor Park, Wisconsin. Another type of transport vessel intimately involved with the Normandy landings were U.S. Liberty ships. At almost 7,000 tons, Liberties were built quickly to make up for the losses, merchant ships to U-boat attacks being mass-produced at relatively low cost. The SS Jeremiah O'Brien entered service in July 1943 and crossed the North Atlantic four times on convoy work before joining the D-Day invasion fleet. She made 11 cross-channel supply runs in the weeks after D-Day. Mothballed post-war, she sat for 33 years in the National Defense Reserve Fleet in North California until a preservation group obtained her, an unaltered World War II Liberty ship that had actually been present off the coast of Normandy on the 6th of June 1944. In 1994, during the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the Jeremiah O'Brien sailed all the way from California to the UK tying up next to HMS Belfast in London, and later sailed over to Normandy, carrying many veterans with her, the only large ship the original D-Day invasion force to manage this feat. Today, she is still operational, based at Pier 35 at San Francisco. And finally, an honourable mention should be made to this lightship, now abandoned and half-sunk off a scrapyard up a river. Lightships were used to mark the passage for the invasion forces crossing the channel to Normandy. 
and took an invaluable part in the Normandy landings, and their crews faced all the same dangers as the naval crews. Light Vessel 7-2 was deployed off the British and Canadian beaches to mark the end of swept channels through the minefields, and later to the artificial Mulberry harbours. A group is trying to raise funds to restore this D-Day survivor, the actual vessel dating from 1903. And please do watch my video about this ship, link in the end screen. Don't forget that Mark Felt and production viewers are getting a special gift from Call of War World War II. Click on the link below to receive 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription for free. Choose a country and fight your way to victory. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.